So, good evening. Here we are. We are back from um, live on YouTube today in a different location. So we had um, we were in our in our cellar at the winery cellar, and um, today we decided to come to my father's, my parents' uh, cellar, personal cellar. Uh, as yesterday we had my sister, today I asked my father if he could come and say just hello. So um, here he is. I have, uh, I take his name from him. He's also Oscar, Oscar Quevedo. Can you pause the Olá. Oscar Quevedo. Um brinde para vós. Saúde. Saúde. So yesterday we were focusing on Tony ports, if you remember. What are Tony ports? Tony ports are those ports that are matured in oak barrels, like those that I have behind me and that my father has in his cellar. Today our focus is going to be the ruby style. Well, for those that are just arriving, today is the first tasting. Let me just briefly um, describe what happened yesterday. So together with your help, we were able to raise 3,500 pounds that we are going to split between two entities, NHS in England and uh, Pesqueira Amiga in our local village. We also had um, my sister coming to say hello. Uh, the rest of the team is Fred, who's here in the... Um, taking care of the, your questions and suggestions. And we are doing this together with Vintage Wine and Port um, in the person of his owner, Tony Carter, and with the huge, fantastic help of the team behind uh, Big Fortified Tasting, Alex Bridgman and Ben Reed. So thank you for these two institutions for helping us putting this together. Then we talked about the history of our family. Our family is a um, relatively young uh, port uh, butler, but with a longer history on the production of grapes and on the production of port. We started making port back in 1889 and we started bottling it in 1991. Um, then we talked about the history of uh, port wine in general, how port wine shows up. The 1650, uh, when we started to have the merchants coming from the United Kingdom to Porto to take the wine, take the port in barrel and, and uh, ship it to England. 1756, the year of the demarcation, when the Douro starts being a, a region um, regulated and delimited. This is very important. This was the first wine region in the world to do something like this. So imagine for the Portuguese uh, to do something that it was so innovative, it's, uh, it's fantastic. And it's still working amazingly after 200 and uh, something years. And then we start tasting ports, three different ports, Reserve Tony, 10 years old, Collated 2004, and we finished pretty much there. You had, you shared with us a lot of questions. Uh, Fred was raising the questions, and um, so we have, we are having an interaction that we hope we are going to maintain today. So Sounds good, Fred? We had a few pending questions and a few questions that arrived during the night, so maybe we, we should address them quickly before jumping to the head of the topic. So uh, one of the questions is, are you going to do again this great advent calendar this year? Somebody wanted to make sure they can offer it to their friends. Uh, that was one of the questions. I think there was a question from Malcolm, if you can explain a little bit uh, the reserve white, but maybe we can talk about the special white port that you're doing and why it's so important for your company. Uh, explain why organic viticulture is also very important and it's going to take more and more place. And finally, are you going to declare a 2018 vintage port? Well, I think this, those are four questions. Let's yeah. see if I don't forget them. <laughs> so, before we get into our tasting, let's address yesterday's questions and overnight questions. Um, Advent calendar. So, about four years ago, we decided to make a port wine calendar. As a port producer, you couldn't do anything else. You couldn't do a whiskey or a gin. It had to be port. So we put together in a box 24 5 CL bottles of port, miniatures, in, um, of 12 different ports. 
So it does not include vintage port because vintage port cannot be bottled in a, in such a small size, but pretty much everything else. And it's a great uh, way of learning more about port, the diversity of port, and having a great time, especially right before Christmas. That's the advent calendar. The question about the white ports. Well, there is a very well um, well known gentleman in the port business. Mr. Coburns, who gave name also to his family, gave name to a, um, um, a big and very successful uh, port house. And Mr. Um, Mr. Coburns uh, used it to say that the first duty of port is to be read. So this shows a lot how the merchants were looking into the white port. They didn't want anything from it. They were not really interested in, in white port. Actually, there was a period of time when white grapes were not allowed to be planted in the Douro Valley. Because the merchants were complaining that they were taking away the concentration that uh, red port uh, should have. People in the Douro doesn't really, uh, didn't really want to, to, to obey. And um, white grapes were still there, were planted. And they were kind of mixing the lagar in small quantities, maybe 1-2% to soften, especially the tony ports, and increase a little bit the acidity that we know that white port has more than reds. So the grapes were used and port was being produced from white grapes. In many cases, a lot of families were making white port, but they were not able to sell that white port. We are included in those families that were not able to sell the white port. So my great-grandparents had, and my grandparents had some stock of white ports. And um, we decided this year to release a 1970 white port. It, it cannot be named on the label 1970 because we did not register this port at the Port Wine Institute of the time. But it is... Um, from 1970, it's now 50 years old, and it's, um, it's a beautiful port, a beautiful white port. We have another one, another white port, which is, uh, that is a little bit old. It's not that old as the 50 year uh, 1970, but it's a reserve white. That reserve white is eight years old, and uh, I know that some of you have already tasted it, Malcolm included. So um, it's, uh, it's also part of our portfolio. We, we have a small quantity of it, so we don't really market it that much because we don't have that much stock. And then on the more entry-level, younger ports, we have a dry that is great with a tonic water and uh, served on, on uh, ice cubes. Uh, regular um, medium dry with about 90 grams of uh, residual sugar white port and a lagrima. Lagrima is the sweeter version of white port, a bit more dense, uh, higher in, in sugar, um, so for those that have a sweet teeth, it's, um, it's interesting. And, um, then we also, for, ah, important thing, vintage port 2018. It's time to, it's time to talk about that. Yes, we are going to declare a small quantity of 5,000 bottles. Um, this is already official. We got the approval from the port when Institute a few days ago, but we were very confident that we were able to do that. 2018 was a harvest with a, that started very, relatively early. It's one of, one of the, those harvests that was still, uh, which picking started in August. Um, it's, um, it comes after uh, two other uh, important uh, vintage uh, port years, 2016, 2017. Uh, but the, the quality of the juice, the quality of the port is, is, is very solid. So there was no reason not to declare a small quantity just because we had declared the two preview, previous years. So this is what I think the, um, the more geek side of our group tonight wants to know, especially those on the port forum. So here is the news. Fred, anything else that we should... Uh, we should yeah, so you're ready for the ports? <laughs> Good. So we are going to start with a late bottle vintage port. Late bottle vintage 2013. It's the one that we have in our bottle. Let me put the bottle here. I found a spot. I don't know if it's going to fall or not. Probably not. Let's see if it's not. Late bottle vintage. So this is, um, we are getting already in the premium style of the rubies. Ruby port is that style that uh, 
keeps more of the character of the um, the harvest. It has a darker color. It has more of the fruity notes, fruity fruits aromas like strawberry, uh, um, some uh, plums, uh, blackberries. So it's definitely on the um, on the wild berry side. And um, ruby port, contrary to tony port, we avoid oxida uh, oxidation. We avoid uh, oxidizing the port. So if we mature it in barrel, it's typically of a large size of a few thousand liters and also for a short period of time. So this LBV was matured in a 14,000 liters uh, Balsero bean. You have seen those when I turned the camera yesterday. So as today we are in my cellars, uh, in my father's cellars, it's not possible to show you that, but um, it's a big one. So the oxidation is very, very little and it, we, we mature it for about 18 months, so not that much, not enough to oxidize, but enough time to get the tannins more soft and round and smooth. Ruby port has a higher concentration of tannins that come from the, directly from the vineyards because we use grapes that have higher concentration of tannins located in lower altitude close to the Dodo River on the terraces where the, the yields per vine are lower. And once at the winery, we like to extract more elements from the skin, more flavors, more tannins, and tannins together with acidity help and a bit of the sweetness help port to mature for many, many decades. Port is among those wines that is better prepared to handle time. And um, LBV is not intended to age for, for several years. I mean, a couple of decades, it's steadily fine. Maybe they will pick uh, before the, the end of the 20th year, but um, they handle well aging in bottle and uh, most of the time they improve uh, during the first few years after after being bottled. Yeah, so what did you prepare for in terms of pairings? Our suggestion, chocolate, especially on the darker side with less sugar and more cacao. Uh, Fred, we have here two chocolates. Yeah. One is a uh, 70% from Madagascar, yeah. and the other one has some uh, nuts in it. Yeah, so it's dark chocolate and grilled nuts. Dark chocolate with grilled nuts. Nuts, it's a great uh, food pairing for port. It goes great with Tony port. It goes great also with a more mature vintage port. And we also have it here. I don't know if you can see it well. Well, some almonds. Let me see. Almonds and figs. And some raisins as well. I hope you can see it well. If at any time you need us to show the food again, just let uh, Fred know. And if you want the recipes of yesterday, we are going to uh, post them um, on, on this uh, thread, on this YouTube video. So maybe on Monday when we are back to the winery, but you'll get it again. So let me try the chocolate. I haven't tried it yet. It's very good. It's a great pairing. The chocolate has this bitterness, and uh, bitterness is also where you get from the tannins of the ruby port of this late bottle vintage. So um, it works. It works pretty well. If you have other food suggestions, let us know. Help the community and uh, let's spread um, what it, it, each one of us thinks that goes better with um, with our ports this evening. One thing that yeah. Well, I was just wanted to point out that so far everybody likes it. Uh, definitely, but everybody speaks about cherries, red currant, which I think is a signature of uh, your 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 vineyard, Valda Vigno. If you turn the bottle, on the back label you'll find the name of the vineyard where this port is coming from, Quinta Valde Agudinho. If you are not familiar with um with um geography of the Douro. Um, it does not, um, the names I'm going to tell you don't, uh, don't help that much. But if you are a bit familiar, if you have heard of Ferradosa um, area 
or even better, maybe Vergella's um, vineyard that is owned by Taylor's. So it's next to it. This is a vineyard that my father, together with my mom, they planted 36, 37 years ago in 1983. And it's a field blend. So we don't ask me about the perce exact percentages of the varieties. I know that we have a lot of Turiga Franca, some Turiga Nacional, Tinta Roriz, Tinta Barroca, a lot of relatively high amount of Tintucão, among Morisco, among few others. This area always makes makes sports very elegant uh, and um, and complex. Um, it's from this vineyard that we also get some of the grapes for our vintage port. We will get there now as we are done with the late bottle vintage. So the next port that we are going to try is the 2013 vintage port, and you may see that it's. It has the sticker under the main label saying Quinta Val de Agudino. So this is our uh, the vineyard that where this port is coming from. Let me move up the camera a little bit lower so you may be able to see it all on the screen. And I'll get a glass for me. So there was two questions regarding Viki. Uh, we can cover uh, what is the process of declaring a vintage port? What I makes a vintage being declared, approved? Uh, we can talk about that. And then Julian had that deep question. How do we Julian. calculate the amount of vintage port produced in a year? Is it still in pipes, in dozens, or now it's liters? Or... Uh, yeah, um, so to the first question, maybe I should explain one detail about late bottle vintage, about the previous port that we just finished. This one. So the late bottle comes because this port, late bottle vintage, has to be bottled between the fourth and the sixth year after the harvest. While vintage port has to be bottled between the second and the third. So it means that the late bottle vintage is matured for a little bit longer. In our case, in the port beans that we have at the winery, the bigger port beans, but also for several months in bottle prior to release them. That's why we call late bottles, because we bottle it later than the traditional vintage port. It has the same style, it, it fits in the same style, it does not have the concentration and the aging potential of vintage port, but it's a very solid, um, high quality ruby standard, ruby port. Vintage port represents less than 1% of the total production. Not for us, but for the whole, and also not, yeah, uh, for us a little bit higher, but for the whole industry, vintage port is less than 1%. So you are, you are now getting into the best of the best. We have two bottles of vintage port to, to taste this evening, this 2013 and the 2005. You will definitely see some evolution compared, uh, comparing the 13 to the 2005. Every single bottle of port Vintage port, late bottle vintage, the colheita, the 10 years old, the reserve tony that we tasted yesterday, everything has to be approved by the Port Wine Institute. It's the Port Wine Institute that certifies the quality, and then we, we are allowed to use this label, this um, certification seal that has a unique number in it, and that, um, that makes it a um, port. For vintage port, the Port Wine Institute, IVDP, sets the highest um, uh, demanding standards. So the concentration has to be very, very intense, dark color, a lot of flavors, a lot of things going on, everything on the primary side. Um, so there should be no evolution, there should be no oxidation, a lot of tannins, a lot of body. So all elements that will allow vintage port to mature for a long period of time. Only then we get uh, the port approved by the the Port Wine Institute. So the, cost, the the level is very, very high. It needs to get 9 out of 10 in score. And you need a majority of the tasters to get it approved. It does not have to be unanimity, but it has to, you need, a, a, of course, a, a majority, over 50% of the tasters. Everything is blind taste. So they know what the producer submitted for approval, like Vintage Port 2013. They don't know who's the producer. So it's um, it's um, 
I think it's quite efficient and it works well in that sense. So Julian's question about um, what's the size that we use to define vintage port. Well, I think it's uh, actually uh, 12 bottle cases, so nine little uh, nine liters nine, nine little liter, liter cases. It's what defines the stock of vintage port brought to the market every year or produced in a certain year. Um, Pipa, uh, which is this size, is 550 liters. These are not exactly the same um, the same casks that we had yesterday. The winery that are, they were behind me. This is a little bit smaller. Why are the casks bigger? One one interesting reason. So the the tray would set 550 liters for the standard uh, measure, but for um, a question of transportation. As it's it's going to be done on on boats, and the risk of um, of a flip of the boat was quite high and happened uh, uh, every other and then. So the the buyer, the, the the merchant that was buying the port, would not fill the cask to the top. So it would put the 550 liters. That would be about 85 percent. 90% of the size of the barrel of the cask, but the other 10% would be air. So in case the boat flips, the barrels would the casks would float and you wouldn't lose your, your cargo. Smart people. Good, so 2013 vintage port. What do you think about that? Are they do you have any suggestions and uh, and any thoughts about this, Fred? Well, the four people are saying it fares very well with 70% lime chocolate. Um, we have, yeah, again, more dark fruit uh, to the fore with a nice spice in the finish, said um, our friend. And then um, I think what's important here is to notice that they are from the same year, from the same vineyard, and one has so much more potential, purity, and concentration than the other one. And that's how we decide to make vintage versus like bottle vintage. Things very typical from the Duro. This is cool to compare 2013 late bottle vintage, 2013 vintage ports. Late bottle vintage, more soft, easier, not as concentrated, not as, not as dark, not as dense as the vintage port. Vintage port, typical from a Godinga vineyard. Is this a kind of mental... Um, um, what's the name in English for that? For uh, manjericão, manjericão. Oh, yeah, uh, no, yeah, kind of passion fruit, but also pesto. Uh, how do you make the pesto oh, from? Basil. Yeah, basil. I always find a bit of basil notes uh, in this uh, in this 2013 vintage port, and it's typical from this vineyard that other years also also happens. You need a relatively fresh year because if it, the, the weather is warm or as it gets hotter, you lose this freshness. Pesto and uh, passion fruit are relatively um, uh, fresh, tropical uh, flavors that will disappear once the temperatures get for many days above 40 degrees during August. If the temperatures go high, if you have a heat wave uh, like we we had in um, in 2003, for instance, you lose all that um, that freshness and raisins start to show up. And more of the plums, blackberry, uh, blackberries, yeah. Cool. Um, two questions. We have more questions. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> there was a question yesterday that I forgot, and somebody asked about it. So I think they connect. Why T cork with plastic and versus full driven cork? Same thing for some of your vintage half bottle, and same thing for your colitas full bottles. That's a very good question. Ah, just before, yeah, that's a very good question. Then I'll, I'll talk about uh, the other thing. Cork. Cork is probably, I mean, it, it is the best uh, closure for a bottle of wine. I think there's no argument uh, um, about that. As long as we are on a long-term perspective. We decided uh, about uh, six years ago in 2000, with the 2014 vintage port, we decided to do something that we, I have never seen anyone in the world doing it, which was 
to bottle the same, exactly the same port, a 2014 vintage port, under four different uh, formats. One which is a regular uh, bottle with a long cork. We have a cork there, Fred. So a cork like this. The second bottle of this box had screw cap. Screw caps are getting more and more popular, especially for white wines and for or wines that are going to be drunk for in a short period of time. The third closure, and I will explain a bit about these closures uh, right once once I finish this. The third closure was a plastic closure. Was uh, has the shape and appearance of a natural cork, but it's actually plastic. It's also relatively popular uh, because it, it it is a cork taint free. So we decided to try and see how it would work. And the fourth bottle was um, a shorter bottle, like a pot bottle. If I had a bottle here, I would show you, but in my father's cellar, I don't have, and I should have brought my apologies. It's a smaller bottle that contains the exactly 750 centiliters. What happens is that I believe that the more close to each other the port is, the better it's going to age. If we have the same 750 liters in a very long, narrow tube, like with a very tiny diameter, I think we all agree that these 750 millimeters would not um, mature age as well as if they were in a regular bottle. So the more condensed, the more uh, like a sphere form we have our bottle, the best it would uh, age. And that was the goal when we when we made these four different formats. So going back to the three the three corks that we use it the natural cork, the plastic, the screw cap, and the plastic. About eighty percent of cork is oxygen. That's why it's so flexible. You can easily compress, and after several hours, it slowly gets back to its original size. It means that some of this oxygen with the time is going to migrate to the exterior but also to the wine and it helps the wine to age to mature if we use a screw cap we are blocking completely the oxygen uh, exchange rate or like uh, yeah like the the, the, um, the the crossing of oxygen to the wine so the wine gets very tight very closed and if you are opening that bottle in the first Two, three years that's fine but if it's to age for a few decades it's not the best uh, it's not the best closure for sure finally the plastic cork that's probably the worst of all the three closures that we use it plastic it's it, there's no there's no uh, taint there's no bad uh, uh, smell that's going to come out of that plastic cork the problem is that after a few years the, that plastic cork loses flexibility and it's going to allow the air from outside to go into the port. So if you are maturing your uh, bottle of port in a, in your garage where you have some uh, your car parking going in and out, or if you have it in a or if you have mold in your garage, or if you have uh, any like f bad flavors that that circulate outside with a plastic cork, they may go into the port. So it's something that it's probably to avoid when you are looking into closures for ports. So we made this this experiment. We produced uh, 500 boxes and we decided to sell half of those and the other half we, we are going to keep for us. And um, we sold uh, several of those boxes to the United Kingdom. We want, more than anything, we want to empower you of this experience. Um, you should have the possibility to see what changes with when you change the closure instead of being me telling you no with the cork happens this with the screw cap happens that and no it should be you to experience on your on your own um, side in your own glasses and uh, to taste it so that's what he did uh, back in 2014 so to the question that we had about regular cork and t cap this cork is by far 
the best cork to seal a bottle of port. But this one is so practical, it's so easy to use. You easily remove it from the bottle and close it back. And you can put it aside for next day and open again and do it. I mean, do it all the way like until you finish the bottle. And if the port that we are using this bar top in, like the ticket, the tea cork, it's to be drunk within a few years after bottling, so there's no reason to go for such a long and expensive cork. One thing, avoid laying down bottles with a with a bar top, with a tea cork. Really avoid. These corks are so easy to put into, into the bottle again that they are not prepared to to close properly the liquid, the port. So avoid avoid it. How you got a lot of people curious about those boxes of experiment and they are asking ah. if you're gonna release more, it's still possible to buy or <laughs> mm -hmm. so this was um a calendar that we release every year and you will have the chance of buying it at the same website where you bought the this fantastic uh, six bottles of port vintage wine and port we released it last year um i know that uh, tony uh ran out quickly of the calendars they were very successful we are trying to catch up a bit on the um, on the stock that we're going to have for this uh christmas season if you like to buy those Pay, pay attention to Vintage um, Wine and Port website or email even better. You can email them now and uh, mention that you'd be interested in getting some or maybe one calendar to give to your friend or for yourself or for your father or for your daughter or whatever. The bottles are relatively small, but it's um, so they are easy to drink uh, every day of the first 24 days of December. Any other questions, Fred? That was a good question. I think we answered it yesterday, but we can repeat. Uh, it's worth mentioning it. Uh, why in some years you declare colletas and in some years you declare vintage? The difference between colleta and vintage port. So these are the only two, well, together with late bottle vintage, but these two ports are from a single vintage. The vintage port requires higher concentration grapes, higher concentration port, a high... Uh, uh, Concentration standard, a lot of color, while the Colleta you want more of the elegance and port that is high, have a bit more of acidity, not necessarily coming down from the vineyards, those vineyards close to the Dodo River. You need uh, elegance balance for to make a Colleta, you need more of concentration to make vintage port, and of course balance is always necessary. But uh, it's possible to make, to produce both in the same year. 2004 is a good example of a, poor, a year that uh, it's not a vintage port year. There are some people, some colleagues of us that declared vintage port, but it was a fresh year. So we didn't have enough concentration to make it uh, a, a big port, vintage port year, but it was fantastic for Tony ports. So 2004 is a good example of those years that um, you get freshness and work better for Tony's and for the Ruby style. Before going to the last uh, vintage, do you want to explain why you use regular traditional cork for your full bottles of bottles? Do you believe that they can age in bottles or there's no stress? Or... Yeah, so going back to the tea, tea corks and the full corks, we use this uh, bar top in our entry level range and in our 375s that are not vintage ports. All the other 75s that are not on the entry level, we use a regular cork. Two reasons. First, we do not know when you're going to drink it. And if you want to lay down the bottle, you're free to do it. It's not going to uh, leak. Well, it may leak after a few decades, but it shouldn't. And um, you and me will be more, more relaxed. Every year we get emails from people, maybe two, three, four uh, people that get one of these bottles that are closed with a bar top complaining that they leaked in uh, in their cellar or in their floor. It happens. So um, there is no way of avoiding that. So we try to keep these uh, very useful corks to the higher rotation and shorter life 
uh, in the bottle ports. That's the thing. Shall we go to the last of the ports this evening? As we are getting close to the end of our two hour um, port wine tasting. Well, actually, this activity of the tasting of the 2005 vintage port started a couple of hours ago. I don't know if you have anyone seen on YouTube the video that we did decanting the bottle of 2005 vintage port. I have the decanter here with me. Here it is. This is um, it's a gift of a friend of Pedro Pardinhas, and um, we decanted this uh, yeah two hours, two and a half hours ago. Um, we gave it time to open up to release a bit of those flavors that were more closed. We could, without any any issue, rinse the original bottle of 2005 vintage port, and put the port back into the bottle. So you could serve the port from the original bottle if you wanted. No problem, no problem at all with that. There was a bit of sediment in this port. Um, sediment also varies from bottle to bottle. So if some of you had no sediment, well, everyone should have a little bit of sediment. If, many, if some of you had a lot of sediment, it's normal. Sediment improve, um, increases uh, with age as the color uh, fades and uh, it concentrates in the bottom of the of the glass and um, I think we're ready we're ready to taste this 2005 vintage port <laughs> Fred are you ready let's go hmm. so uh, one one thing yesterday uh, we were using the um, like small wine glasses like this shape white 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 wine shape uh, today i also we also brought the traditional port glasses they are much smaller as you can see um the top is more narrow so the flavors get a bit more close there especially the alcohol it's not so exuberant once it come, come, comes out um i mean there's no rule here feel free to use one of the other something in between these two shapes i think work well um it's more of your personal preference by the way what's the temperature to serve vintage port so i'm put the decanter back Vintage port. We should treat vintage port as we treat regular red wine. Contrary to the tannins that have less tannins, vintage port has more tannins and more concentration. Tannins get very bitter and sharp when they are served at cold temperature. We can go as low as maybe 5 degrees, ideally 8, 9, 10 degrees for white wine, but we should not go that low for red wine. So my suggestion for vintage port is to serve at around 15 degrees. Um, ideally, uh, drinking temperature is between 17 to 18 degrees. Serve it a little bit cooler so it's going to warm up in the glass. Your house is probably not at 15 degrees, not even at 18 degrees. It's going to be at 20 degrees. The glass is going to be at 20, 21, 22 degrees. So the minute you, you, you put the port into the glass, it's going to warm up. So um, you need um, you need to count on maybe two three degrees uh, uh, warming in the first maybe five five minutes of serving. Um, swirl is something that helps the flavors to come out, and it helps you to get the the aromas that you you get into the, in the into the wine into the port. So swirl for a few seconds. And then, once you have them in your mouth, avoid um, swallow immediately. You have different tasting buds located in different parts of your tongue. So the more that you are able to spread the wine, the port, over your mouth, more experiences, more, more flavors you're going to feel. More things are going to happen. Maybe you are wondering how, how do we manage to keep sober uh, when you have to work on a like 
30, 40, 50 uh, cask samples in a morning. We speed all the time. Speeding is a key part of our job. Otherwise, we would we would have a short life in this in this uh, in this position. Um, and even when you speed, you always get something in, in into your stomach. So the limit is maybe 30 to 40 wines. After that, you get too tired and you can start to feel the alcohol. Today is different. Today is Friday, and we are only tasting three ports. So of course, that we want to we want to swallow. Get your bottle of 2004 Codeta next to you because we want to compare it with a 2005 vintage port. Go grab it. Food pairing. I'll go back to the port because I want to tell you a couple of things. So Fred's suggestion. Uh, we tried to keep local. Yesterday we went to the Manchego. I know it's our neighbor in Spain. Today we decided to keep as local as possible. Uh, so we have some. Uh, ah, we can you can see better if I put it like this. You have some goat cheese, local goat cheese. Is is it local? It's local. Yep. And it's actually their mom's marmalada. Oh, and my mom's marmalada. We have a few queens trees, and um, sometimes we lose the queens because um, they have to be harvested right after the grape, the harvest of the grapes, and we are so tired after the after making the wine and. The harvest of the the grapes that we lose our queens, but it looks like my mom is not uh, distract is not being distracted by the the grape harvests and still picking these um, queens. Marmalada with um, with cheese. I think this is a classic. I mean, it, it never goes wrong with these two with these two um, food going together. Let me try the cheese. Oh, and mom's marmalada as well. So a couple of interesting questions. Um, are you feeling well? I think it's it's a reality that port has changed. Vintage port has changed in the sixties, seventies, eighties. Maybe they are getting easier to drink when they're young. But how do you feel your company style has changed over the years? So the evolution of vintage port throughout the last fifty years. And how it had changed for our company. Well, in the past, the production of vintage port compared to the total production of port was much higher than it is nowadays. It means that we could say that the average quality of vintage port is probably not as high as it is nowadays. Nowadays, what changed is that we are making less port in Lagar. I don't know if you know what a lagar is, but it's like um, a granite or actually stone, it can be a schist, um, a stone um, square that goes as high as the size of your leg, where we put grapes and thread the grapes. We foot thread the grapes uh, up to a little bit above your knee. So instead of uh, putting the grapes being crushed and um, Extracting the color with the use of an engine, we use human uh, foot to to crush the berries and to release the elements from the skin. Our bare foot is quite soft, so it's not going to break the seed, the pipe that we have in the in the um, berry, which is very bitter. Nowadays we have less lagars. Lagar have um, a disadvantage, in my opinion, which is oxidation. They are open, and you have a, a big mass of grapes in contact with oxygen. Until fermentation starts, there is no CO2 protection on the top of it. So um, your must is going to oxidize. It's like when you make a smoothie. If you leave the smoothie for several hours um, away, you can. when you go back, you'll see that the color changes. And so you have to be very careful. It's true that we use uh, sulfites as a way of protecting the, the must from oxidation. But lagars are less used now than they were used before. What we have now better is probably the hygiene conditions at the winery. So we have this balance um, of less production of vintage port in the last two decades, um, probably of a 
higher quality overall. Time will tell. We need de decades to, to realize if that's true or not. In our case, we start uh, bottling for for um, to sell with our own label. We have, well, some of these bottles behind are from my father's ex uh, like production in the Lagar. Maybe I'll get one or two and I can show you. But we only start making vintage port. The first one is this one, 2005. So we always had a, on, we always had a, a drier style of vintage port, of port in general, with a, a more a bit more austere, um, with more um, more tannins present. Um, so it's it's kind of our house style. There are few other houses that also play on a on a lower. Uh, level of residual sugar others prefer a bit sweeter it's really up to you to to pick those that you prefer to like the most let me see what i get from my father's uh wall oh, i think worth mentioning uh julian suggested that vintage pork goes very well with pepper steak and uh, oh yeah steak. yeah that's like another great food suggestion is um if you want to bring uh port to the table for the main dish, um, a steak is, is a fantastic experience. Um, use and abuse of the pepper because the vintage port is going to be ready to, to soften your mouth uh, when the pepper hits the, the tasting buds and gets really spicy. So, I mean, my, my family would, we would keep some of the port that we were selling to the merchants in, in these bottles. We would label, I, I don't know if you can read it, so this is a 1975 uh, Vinho Generoso Pesqueira. Yeah, so something like this. Is it too big to explain why it's called Vinho Generoso and not pork? Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> so this one is a 70. You can see here Casa Quevedo. Well, actually, we only have 10 minutes, more or less. Yeah. Okay. So, we're getting towards the end. And, um... If you have any, any question that you have to answer yeah. right now? So there's a couple of questions, and I think uh, we should explain a few... Well, talk about a few couple of things. First, are you, do you have a feeling that somebody else in your family, either your generation or uh, your lineage or Sylvia's lineage, is going to be part of uh, the future of the company? Well, I think I have never said this in public, but maybe it's um, a good moment. I really hope that my children, I have three children, five, three, and six months old, so they are still very young. And I hope that they decided to get a job where they really have, can be a happy and fulfilled um, adults. My father never put any pressure on me to come back to help in the, in the wine business. And uh, that was probably the best thing that he could have done. And it made me come back five years after I started my, my career in banking with a huge uh, motivation to help the family to do things better. And um, if my children are not ready to, to take over, they don't want to take over, it's totally fine. Uh, maybe my, my sister's children will. And it's more important that the someone motivated takes over the business than have just my one of my child or my the three of them just uh, running the business because they are my my children. I don't think that that's um, that should happen. I think it should be the one that is more motivated, maybe the one or two or three, hopefully not that many, otherwise it starts to be hard to manage between cousins and brothers and sisters and all that. But um, yeah, I think it's it, they, should, they should be free to decide. And if I would like any of my children to, to take it over, yes, but it's their decision, it's their call. And then maybe more work for us. Claire gave us the suggestions that we should do a second thing, but only about white port. And there's quite a few people already saying they want to participate really? in such a thing. So. <laughs> It's your fault, Tony. It's your fault, Alex. Um, before I forget, happy birthday, Penny! Oh, yeah. And uh, before we forget, are we comparing the 04 and the 05? Yeah, 04, 05. Thank you for helping to keep... I think we're going to need overtime. 
Yeah, we need to do maybe right. over time. Over time. Um, yeah. So, do you have your glasses ready? I we don't have ours, yeah. but we'll get them soon. Okay. Hello, that's okay. I left with it. It's too good to. Uh... <laughs> um, what is it? Thousand four. It should be in the back. So this is my thousand five. Two thousand four from yesterday. I'm sure that some of you have an empty bottle. Those that don't can now drink the rest. So we are com we are comparing just to be clear and make sure that no one is gonna get lost. We are comparing these two. Bum -bum. Let's see if it doesn't they won't fall. Okay, we have a fig hanging here. So what I see, and maybe we will agree on this. We don't have to agree. Actually, it's very boring if you all agree on everything. But I think it's uh, in terms of uh, visual things, uh, like a visual approach, show us that colleta has a, a browner color, as it should be. If you recall well, the Tony Owl has uh, light brown feathers, orange like brick color. And um, the vintage port has more of um, a reddish, uh, like red color. It's not very dark, but uh, it's getting actually lighter, more elegant red, but it's still totally on the red side, not on the brown side. So there's no any sign of oxidation in the vintage port. It's a very young, it's a relatively young vintage port, so it shouldn't, it shouldn't be. In the Colleta 2004, we can feel a bit of this nuttiness, a bit of the caramel notes, a bit of the oxidation uh, coming, uh, brought together with a bit of the smoke notes. You can feel the a bit of the oak, the oakiness. Well, in the vintage port, we are more on the primary fruit. We are more on the strawberry notes. You may get a bit of evolution as well. I don't know if cacao is the best thing, but maybe figs or plums, dry plums. Julian is asking in a tasting, would you do tonnies first and then rubies? Or how does it feel to taste tonnies again after uh, the rubies? Well. I have had both ways, rubies first and Tony's after, or Tony's, uh, Tony's first, uh, rubies after. And actually, they, there are two rules. One, you should go from lower acidity to higher acidity. And you should go from uh, less tannins to higher tannins. And you cannot fulfill both rules uh, when you are deciding which you should go first. Tony Port has higher acidity, but less tannins. So if you follow the criteria of the acidity, you should taste rubies first and finish with the tonis. If you follow the criteria of the tannins, you should taste tonis first and rubies after. Your call, Julian. Well, let's get to the right, the, the last question, Fred. Keep typing. Okay. But should me? I, I think we should give an extra five minutes. I think there's a couple of things we need to talk about. Uh, just like Chloe mentioned, are you guys offering visits? The answer is yes, but talk about the situation. How are we going to reopen? I want you to talk about organic. How is it important for your company? And the future projects that are coming that are super interesting for the people uh, watching us. Cool. So three things. Visits. Well, yes, but no. Uh, no, but later, yes. Uh, the COVID-19 changed our lives. It also changed um, what Fred has been doing at the winery. Now he's helping more on the bottling line and less uh, touring people around. Um, we do want to receive people. We do want to uh, give you the chance of experiencing our ports directly from our cellar or at least from our winery. Uh, right now, we are not yet ready to take visits. I hope that soon we will start under some conditions as everyone will understand we are working on a on a procedures manual to make sure that everyone will uh, will be comfortable with the situation um we uh, 
bought an um, old warehouse, an uh, old lodge in Villa Nova de Gaia, so in Porto. That is um, it's ready to, it's not open because of the virus, but it will open uh, in the next, hopefully, two or three months. Um, and that's where you ha want to have uh, your, you, if you are not able to spend a few days in the Douro, at least you can visit and have contact with our ports in the city of Porto. It's our new uh, investment. It could hardly be in a worse time. My father had told me that. But I mean, life is this is life, and uh, February in uh, early February never thought that the uh, COVID would be so big. Organic, organic is something that um, the family is committed to. Um, I think not not because we all only eat organic, not because we are like chasing for organic food anywhere, just because we believe that it's possible to make to grow grapes at an acceptable cost using no uh, chemicals or at least a very very low amount of chemicals and make it more sustainable for the nature and for our body so um, we are not very conservative in this approach we are more of committed to reduce our impact and we started by five hectares we have now uh, getting close to 20 we start with red grapes uh, we red vi grapes for red vi vines for red grapes we have also whites now we have all, all, all our olive oil production under organic. So uh, we hope to be able to expand more. It requires more labor and we are a bit short of labor in, in Portugal. People don't want to live in the countryside and they don't want to um, work in agriculture. It's a little bit like everywhere, no? Yeah, um, there was another question for that I think I forgot. Um, no, uh, well, no? the organic, the future project, the new winery, the new vineyards. Oh, yeah. The, the new tasting experience that's coming. Yeah, the new winery. Well, um, you, if, when you come to, if you come to visit in the next 12, 18 months, you'll see that the structure is now too small to accommodate everything that we want to do, all the, our projects. And we are quite experimentalists, so we will soon... Um, increase the area of production the area of um, stock where you stock ports the area for the bottling line the area for the offices i mean we start being uh, two people 20 years ago maybe even 15 years ago and we are now six or seven people in the office so and we are still the same structure so uh, we need to we need to expand and that's the the thing that is now in the pipeline for the next maybe 12 to 18 months white port so maybe we'll be back with white ports. I think we have a total of five or six white ports, so we can do something similar to this. Let's see if you find the right timing for that. Big thanks to Julian for making the tasting nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Julian Wiseman, uh, the genius uh, behind the port forum. Um, the software to make maps for vintage more tasting. Uh, I, I mean, it's endless, the discussions <laughs> with, uh, with Julian. I'm not going to <laughs> get and into uh, that. If you want to know more about port, if you are really passionate about port, there's an amazing forum. The Port Forum. It's a UK-based forum. There's another one in the US of another friend, Roy Hirsch, for the love of port. The guys on the Port Forum are super passionate about port. They know a lot and uh, humble. They will be happy to receive those that are newcomers. Um, from our side, once again, for helping us to donate some money for the um, charities that need it. And I think this is it, no? No? There's one more note. It's going to be the last note. The voucher. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I hope that everyone has received the voucher. Take it when you come to visit us in Portugal. You can use it in our cellar in um, Gaia or in the winery in the Douro. Either one works. We have a small uh, souvenir for you that you know that is on the voucher. Um, if you want, drop me a line on uh, social media or to my email. My email is oscar at cavedoportwine.com and uh, we will keep in touch let's finish this now fred do you have any last last minute question i already said to the people if they have any more questions give my email address and we'll be 
happy to, uh, to enter them all. Thank you, Fred, for helping us. Thank you, everyone that is behind this. See you soon. Take care.